Good morning, Kritika. Good morning, Samir. Very warm welcome to all, all of you. Fantastic right. to be here. Yes. Good morning, sir. Good, Good morning. Morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Hope you all are doing well. So I think we Fantastic. can start the session. Absolutely. All right. So a very good morning to all our esteemed attendees of this session. Uh, the topic of our session, uh, which is hosted by University, is Industry 4.0 and the Future of Education. Uh, we are joined with by two very eminent personalities. Uh, we are joined by Mr. Samir Dhanrajani, who is the CEO of AI Curate, a bespoke global AI advisory and consulting firm. He has consulted with several global 500, uh, Fortune 500 global enterprises. He's also a renowned author, columnist, blogger, and a TEDx speaker. He's the author of best-selling book, AI and Analy uh, Analytics, Accelerating Business Decisions. Uh, welcome, Samir, sir. We're so glad to have you as a part of this session. Thanks, Ritika. Uh, we are also joined by our esteemed Vice Chancellor of Vijay Bhumi University, Dr. Atish Chattopadhyay. Uh, and we're all really, I'm sure all of you are as excited as I am for this engaging conversation on the future of education and the opportunities that Industry 4.0 uh, beholds for students who are now going to be pursuing higher education. Uh, so uh, the general format of this entire discussion will be that first I will invite uh, Mr. Samir Dhanrajani and then Dr. Atish to uh, share their views on uh, Industry 4.0 and the future of education. After that, we will have a QA and a round, where as a moderator, I have prepared about uh, six to 10 questions, which I will ask them on the topic, after which I will open it up uh, for everybody else to ask our speakers any question that they think would be appropriate to, uh, uh, to the topic. So the uh, way we would do that is that anybody who has a question during the session, Please feel free to type in your question in the chat box that you can see on your right hand side. Uh, once you type the question in during the Q&A round, the open Q&A round, I will read out the question for everyone's benefit and then either uh, Dr. Atish or uh, Samir sir will be answering them. Right. So without further ado, let's get into the session. I would first like to invite uh, Mr. Samir Dhanrajani to talk to us about what is this industry 4.0 uh, that people are talking about today? What is the fourth industrial revolution that the world is witnessing? What are the kind of new career opportunities that are opening uh, in this new gig economy that has been created? So we'd love to first hear from you, Samir, sir, on your perspective on industry 4.0. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ritika, and uh, morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this esteemed uh, gathering, of course, virtually. And I hope everyone is staying sa safe in this uncertain times. Uh, well, I, I think the topic per se is uh, very relevant and uh, topical in the context of what we are seeing, today, which I call it a uh, holy grail of disruption, innovation and transformation. And before I come to the industry 4.0, as a part of genealogy, if we take uh, from the time of mechanization to mass production, to the advent of the technology and the software revolution we saw in early 90s or late 90s, until last seven years or rather five years, we have seen this emergence of what we say, uh, exponential technologies, uh, new age, uh, companies and digital. Now, if, if I take a quote from Ray Kurzweil, who's a, a very uh, famous futurologist and uh, he anticipates and spot uh, trends, uh, his definition uh, is all about that. It's, it's like if I paraphrase uh, uh, the intuition, our intuition about future is always linear while the technology always move in non-linear fashion. The case in point is if I take 30 steps linear, 
I, I do 30 kind of a, let's say, a part of the things, but if I take those 30 steps in non-linear fashion, it becomes exponential to a billion steps. That's the power of technology, what we are talking today, in fact. And as it happened in all the previous three revolutions or the industry 3.0 genres, it has brought a big facet of change in terms of future of work, future of uh, technology, future of workforce, and of course, future of education. And for future of education, of course, we'll have Dr. Rapesh talk about uh, uh, in, in detail. But when we talk about industry 4.0, today we are talking about a whole suite of new age technologies. I mean, and this is all in the overarching bucket of what we say uh, digital. And the underpinning or the foundation of digital is nothing but artificial intelligence. But before I come to AI, uh, the new age career opportunities, uh, I, I just also want to build a facet in terms of some numbers and uh, uh, some bit of analysis. Now, when we talk about specifically in terms of what is the spectrum of students, what we have today and what are the jobs and how does this whole deployment uh, ratio looks like, it's, it's a very interesting uh, scenario. Uh, we've got today, uh, per the latest number, 34, 34.8 million students who pass out from high school every year. Out of that, 1.8 million students go for engineering colleges and rest go for different management to IT and other vocational courses. The deployability rate of jobs, of the, the engineering uh, students getting jobs is overall 18%. Top 100 engineering students in India have a deployability ratio of 41%. The Indian technology workforce is close to about 4.4 million professionals. It contributes about 9% of our India's GDP. Growing, take out this year, which we anticipate because of the COVID and the pandemic to be a kind of a, let's say, an outlier. But over the last 10 years has grown at a whopping pace of 12%, which is the highest among any of, I would say, the growth in the GDP, what we have seen in India. Now, when we look at 4.4 million workforce, the average age of this workforce is close to about eight years. But the fact over there is that all these new age technologies have come in into the mainstream in just last three to four years. There are 300 and rather 300,000 open positions in just analytics AI alone today. One is to 35 is selection ratio, which means for every one professional who's interviewed, or rather 35 professionals on an average who gets interviewed, only one gets picked up. That's the dichotomy we are talking about in terms of the overall value chain of what I see uh, the learning to kind of a, let's say, uh, knowledge as well as to the deployment by the industry. Now, this is where the whole aspect when we talk about and we will discuss more in detail, but I'm leaving with the thought is, which which of course, as, as part of the overall webinar sessions, we, we will talk about. Is it enough for us to look at today what our students are going through in terms of the courses, what they are understanding? Second, not to miss, there is a huge set of gig economy which has emerged after us which has a 60 million professionals as part of the gig economy india is second in terms of 15 million uh, as part of the workforce which is the biggest professionals today are enjoying contracts contractual jobs freelancer consultant experts and then there is something what we call the essential skills which was erstwhile soft skills which has often not been talked about, but becoming very, very mainstream. The art of problem solving, the art of contextualized learning, conflict management, persuasion, and Dr. Atish will talk about that also as part of his narrative. But if we look at this entire spectrum of how do we today under industry 4.0, bake a student into a kind of a sustainable professional, do we have the entire 
responses to the value chain what he or she goes through today i'll just leave it at that and we'll come back as part of the i would say details later uh, thank you so much samir sir for sharing your perspective on uh, industry 4.0 and the vuca world that we are operating in now may i please invite our esteemed vice chancellor dr atish chatopadhyay to share his perspective on what is the future of education uh so today we are talking about disruptions of all kinds in the job market so how should curriculums evolve today to create skill sets that prepare professionals for this industry revolution 4.0 and how universities what are the steps that they must take uh to ensure that we are creating a ready workforce for all these changes that are happening today uh, thank you kritika thank you samir it's fantastic the you know the, you have set the context by state uh, saying that you know only 18% of the engineers get employed and uh, 41% of even from the top schools so i will give you take you through through a small presentation as to uh, you know what it is uh, like how we can look at things and uh, in terms of uh, the questions i saw from some of the participants what a school leader can do about the gig economy and uh, how market disruptions are actually you know impacting jobs uh, i think this is a little bit of a background i have been with spgmr for long then maika amdabad and then as director of imt ghaziabad before moving to ifim business school and then now with vijay bhumi university now little bit of introduction to the school okay we are located at karzat near uh, mumbai uh we are the last local train station so to say and our philosophy is the fact that education is about enablement that's the basic philosophy and i think that is what we believe in and that's what led us to uh, you know uh, uh, to really come up with this universe university uh this is the actual uh, picture of the university you can see the, the hills behind and uh, these are the buildings which are reasonably flat structure and uh, we are india's first liberal professional university so that's a very unique uh, you know characteristics of our university we combine liberal education with that of the professional education now why we do that what you know uh, and how it helps to deal with market disruptions and the changes i will come to those questions just to give you a background if i look at the top 10 fortune 500 companies you know in 2007 we were being dominated by the oil companies and the banks so there were four oil companies and three banks that's how the top 10 fortune 500 looked like in some 12 years back let us look at what happened by 2018 we don't find a you know the oil companies dominating any further we had all the digital companies dominating the alphabet the microsoft the facebook the amazons of the world so you know the change already happened in a period of just 10 years 7 to 8, 2007 to 2018 we certainly find all the digital companies right there and that's where it is you can see microsoft alpha alphabet amazon alibaba facebooks of the world apple all of them started dominating the market now i wrote one article somewhere in 2018 i was just looking back that was in business today and uh, i talked about the fact that there is a need of the hour is to redesign the curriculum for students operating in industry 4.0 and uh, some uh, someone asked this question how market disruptions are impacting jobs now the disruption that is happening because of this vuca the few trends we can see number one the playing field has become you know uh, level which means that it is not about how much capital you can invest but it is more about the knowledge that you can bring in the areas which are emerging are the next gen areas even today if you look at the covid 19 crisis we are talking about the whole issue of bioinformatics how fast we can get into you know the online mode work from home all the these are next gen areas so who is going to succeed succeed going forward it's uh, not the bigger one earlier it was the bigger one who succeeded today it is about those who will be 
you know, faster. It's not the bigger, but the faster who are probably going to succeed going forward. And that is what Beyond Tomorrow is all about. So three key trends, uh, level playing field, next generation areas, and it is not the bigger, but the faster, which is going to succeed when we are talking about Beyond Tomorrow. I think that is the key change which has happened. Samir, you can always come in between whenever you feel like. So what are the key trends? Uh, trend number one, the big mega trend, shifts from an industrial to service and then service to a knowledge economy. I think that's the shift, industrial economy to service, and today we are talking about a knowledge economy. Number two, leave aside the COVID, we are to, looking at a 100-year life, okay, which is a reality. So, you know, I don't know. I think even our generation, if I look at it, will probably live for 100 years. Our next generation definitely is going to live for 100 years. You know, this COVID crisis will be definitely overcome. So once that is there, we will be there. You can expect a longer lifespan for all of us. Now, if you are going to live for 100 years, majority of the life is anticipated spent working. Okay, so earlier if you used to live for 70 years, 60 years, you work, 10 years is retirement. Now, 100 years work life means you are probably going to work for 80 years. And that is how we are going to prepare. Now, what is the impact of digital? This is the third important, important trend. Important of digital is the three eyes of learning. Interactive, integrated, and individualized. So, you know, as you can see, that you know learning has become more interactive it has become integrated and it is individualized so it is more one to one which digital has made possible so what are the key questions that as education leaders we need to really respond to question number 1 how should educational institutions respond to this changing nature of work in terms of the new skill sets so what are those new skill sets which we need to really look at. Number two, what kind of education will equip the students to remain relevant in future? So education earlier was that, you know, you finish college education and that is good enough to sustain uh, for your entire professional career. Now, the question is with the changes happening so very fast, how we can equip our students to remain relevant in the future? And number three, as we are talking about a 100 year life, how do we prepare our graduates for a 100 year life? I think these are the three key questions. New skill sets, number one, what would be the new skill sets? Number two, how do our graduates remain relevant? And number three, how do we prepare for a 100 year life? Uh, we, when we are looking at that, we were, you know, we look back at the future of jobs report, which were, which was published with the World Economic Forum, and they identified the key skill sets which are required for the future, and those were very interestingly, you know, the they are listed here: complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence judgment and decision making service orientation negotiation and cognitive flexibility it is very interesting if you look at it and even during this crisis what is becoming important is today is the whole issue of emotional intelligence the whole issue of cognitive flexibility okay and nothing has become more important than service orientation in today's situation and of course problem solving has become much more complex than ever before and critical thinking, creativity, all these has assumed very big significance in the present scenario. What we did was we wanted to find out how this will be relevant in India. Because most of the studies earlier has happened in the context of the developed nations. And we thought that there's a need for an India specific study. We went back with two questions. What are the India-specific unmet needs that the universities must address today? That was the first question. And question number two was, uh, how can the uh, Indian 
uh, companies and the academia respond to the new set of skill sets which were identified by world economic forum so one is india specific unmet needs and number two response of india uh, 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 indian companies and academia to this new set of skill sets which were identified by the world economic forum what we did was we partnered with the national human resources developed network we at ifim partnered with the national human resources developed network and uh, wanted to find out what would be the india specific needs uh, it was a very interesting st study we actually surveyed 292 executives senior executives all over the country through a structured questionnaire then we did three round tables in three locations mumbai delhi and bangalore where around 43 senior executives participated out of which 18 were cxos samir would you like to add something over here because you are very much there part of this yes uh, definitely dr atish i, th I think uh, one of the key aspect uh, what got discussed in those round tables uh, and as part of uh, uh, the larger scheme of things one uh, of course this emergence of digital technologies it's not one but a whole stack of new age technologies we call it ai cyber security iot blockchain and all uh, b uh, it also uh, meant that the cxos were saying in terms of the new professionals uh, who are kind of coming into the market can they also exhibit what used to be the soft skills which has become essential skills the hard skills as uh, you rightly said uh, which means uh, while we look at careers uh, today which is a amalgamation of knowledge skills and attitude and knowledge and skills mix a person or a professional's attitude so it's very essential at the school level to build that knowledge and skills which are easy for the organizations today to relate to because one of the thing which also stood out in the meetings today that when students irrespective of the background whether it's management or uh, kind of let's say engineering uh, get assessed by the company uh, for the entries into the workplaces only 12 percent of the students make the card in terms of assessment and that's a very dismal number because somewhere while the conceptual learning is very good but the contextual learning in terms of how the concept needs to be related to today's workplaces is changing and one of the things which also stood out as part of the entire discussion and which is relevant today that as you rightly said dr ratish if we are talking about the longevity of almost 50 to 60 years of professional career given the kind of moods law approach we are facing in technology today which is likely to continue we can't think of students looking at one career throughout their 50 years of professional life it's need it needs to be staggered in terms of maybe a three to five year horizon then they go through another round of learning or rather unlearning relearning kind of a phase and then look at what other careers are available or relevant at that point of time so i think these are the things which to rightly what you said will continue and that that will compel students academia and industry, I would say experts to think in terms of how career needs to be shaped up. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So uh, it was very interesting to do this exercise. It was a very extensive exercise where we collected 292 you know, uh, survey data and then you know, round tables which were moderated in three cities. I was personally present in each one of them and it were all recorded. Now, what were the key findings of the IFIM and HRDN study? Now, these were the 10 you know, uh, top needs that came up. The first one is learning orientation and analytical mindset. That's the number one need. So uh, the industry said, we are looking for people who are continuous learners. That's the key. Continuous learner is the first need. Second, uh, earlier, if you look at, uh, you know, one of the earlier work which was done in 2008 by uh, Harvard Business School, Professor Srikant Data, Patrick Cullen and David Gravin, they said communication is one of the key needs. But what we found was the change was 
the integration of data communication and technology that became a very important need how do you integrate these three number three very important and i think in today's situation you know uh, nothing can be more important than this solution orientation and problem solving so you know uh, it came out very clearly that it is very difficult to really come up with long range strategies what becomes important is an orientation towards problem solving and solutioning now look at it nobody really expected this covid crisis and uh, solution orientation or how do you find a solution and each state each country as a matter of fact is trying to find out their own way so solution orientation is a key aspect of you know a future leader number 4 dealing with change and uncertainty in a very unstructured situation again no no you don't know what is going to come dealing with change and uncertainty even uh, some three weeks back we didn't know that we will not be operating from our college premises but from our home and if you look at the exit plan which the government has come out i don't find for the next four months any of the school or college is going to actually start then how do we continue with our academic calendar how do we do our exams how do we do our ex you know uh, admissions all these are challenges even for an academic leader so dealing with change and uncertainty that's a very important you know what are called need that came up people and team orientation that's very important it was there in the world economic forum report also people management it came up here also people and team orientation then the whole issue of innovation and creativity now if you are dealing with unstructured situations like change and uncertainty how do you come up with innovative solutions that's a key aspect so innovation and creativity came out to be a very strong need then the whole issue of social sensitivity and cross cultural orientation i think the present crisis has again put forward the whole issue of social sensitivity and cross cultural orientation and it is very interesting that lot of schools lot of colleges institutions organizations have come up to actually create a you know uh, uh, take such steps which you know which makes everyone within the uh, country actually you know be comfortable have their meals can stay at home i think this issue of whole issue of the social sensitivity and some of the large companies coming up to help i think that is a very key thing of a leader today then the other very important thing which came up very important is about managing self and again you know this we report we published in 2019 and we never knew that it will become so important today that self management which is a combination of self awareness self development and very important the wellness okay now we never considered wellness as an important aspect of managing self in today's context i think wellness is far more important than anything else you can see the entire world can lock down in the whole issue of wellness so managing self involved self awareness self development self development and also wellness the other thing which came up very clearly was while we talk about you know uh, expertise in a particular area but individuals need to have a multidisciplinary approach we cannot be just you know the future leaders cannot be just you know one discipline expert but they need to have a broad wide angle view broader understanding of various disciplines and finally the whole issue of globalization we you know uh, in today's context we need to understand uh, the future leaders the what the industry expected was that you know the whole issue of how we are integrated with the global systems even today if you look at it even though we need so much of hydrochloroquine in but the fact is that even us wants that and we probably cannot say no today there is a decision going to be taken which means that how uh, what is the interplay with the global players that becomes important if you want to download the report you can definitely download the report but by clicking on this particular you know uh, what to call link samir would you like to add something over here this is a very interesting topic you are very much again part of this uh i i want to pick up uh, two things uh, what you said dr atish one is this managing self uh, i think it's invariably today number one agenda for 
uh, I would say a lot of corporate professionals, academicians, and uh, uh, I would say even uh, uh, folks who are associated with wellness. And uh, there is an analogy I always say that as, as individuals, uh, we are fraught with competition. Uh, we are uh, besieged with a lot of peer pressure and there is stress and anxiety. And uh, imagine the students who are in this young, nimble age group, uh, that entire thing becomes very daunting. And some of the experts uh, have always said that, look, okay, that piece around empathy, wellness, uh, de-stress needs to come in. But uh, I think it's more relevant in terms of today's time that each one of us, and this goes for a lot of students and as part of our imparting what needs to be done is uh, creating a personal algorithm, I keep on saying, which is algorithm, nothing in terms of a definition is a set of pattern, which is individualistic and personalized for us. And when that algorithm, which is nothing but how do we function, how do we behave, how do we consume knowledge, how do we transact, how do we emote, becomes more personalized, we found something which is a concept today called Ikigai, which is sense of purpose. And that purpose is nothing but more individualistic. And the faster the student realizes that, look, how individually they can create their own algorithm to be successful in life, career and relationship, things become easy. And that's where I think the power of staying relevant to the point of Ratesh in terms of a 50, 60 year of corporate career will hold good. Fantastic. So I think Samir made a very important point that 50, 60 years of corporate career. Now, this is what some of the insights which were there in the study. Uh, one of the things was that the workforce has become multi-generation, which is, you know, uh, today we probably need to mix uh, senior practitioners with younger graduates or MBAs. So workforce is multi-generation. So if a 60-year-old guy, a 50-year-old guy, a 40-year-old guy, and 20-year-old guy, they're all in different generations. They view technology, they, their view of life, their worldview is very, very different. Number two and very important point is the whole issue of continuous learning. And uh, we got a very interesting feedback that by 40, some of the professionals become fossilized. And that was exactly the language used that by 40 people get fossilized and hence there is a need for continuous learning. Then the third most important issue was the requirement to individualize the curriculum because you cannot have one size, one size fit all type of a curriculum. It has to be uh, catered to one's, uh, it has to be designed in a manner that it caters to individual style, pace and career stage. Very important point that came up was the whole issue of research. We, we always probably thought that we will give some you know, or inputs and the students need to really learn that and then reproduce that. Uh, what has become important, and that's what came up very clearly, that a research or research orientation needs to be integrated as part of the curriculum. As we stated earlier, wellness and fitness emerges as a critical component of managing self. Probably universities need to introduce programs which will equip students towards wellness and fitness. I think post the COVID crisis, this is a what I call a, a requirement. It will not be debated any further. So I think wellness becomes the most wellness becomes a very very important aspect of managing self. And the whole issue of solution and service mindset, the whole issue of solutioning, service mindset and execution assumes more significance than strategy. These were the key factors. Samir, do you like to add anything here? Uh, Dr. Atesh, and you well articulated, uh, just want to add, uh, uh, starting from the first point, you said, yes, uh, this whole uh, new generation of workforce, uh, Gen Z, uh, millennials, baby boomers, as we call it, uh, in the erstwhile set of career opportunities, the stress and emphasis was more about team handling, span of control. Today, each and every professional is an expert in its own right. And there is not one particular technology which rules. It's an amalgamation, and you rightly said, a multifarious, multidimensional approach. And that's why the relevancy of picking up learning from different genre, genres 
comes into the picture. And I call it a Netflix model of learning uh, in terms of different genres of movie or titles or kind of, let's say, content. Mm -hmm. And it becomes personalized in terms of that pattern. And it starts showing you up in terms of what you want to do. Certainly at a stage, what we are talking about, and Dr. Atul rightly said, if the learning has to be continuous, the learning cannot be one size fits all. The aggregation of credit needs to happen in terms of what students would like to pick up, gain from different sources avail available across the globe, could be, let's say, the Coursera, or could be, let's say, a kind of a part of the curriculum, or could be his or her own creation, and then get into a mode of problem solving by relating to industry portals like GitHub, Kaggle, is something which is very imminent in terms of that student to realize that, look, learning could be from everywhere. And I think that's where the model of education, to the point what Dr. Atish is saying, uh, it, education 4.0 will emerge. Fantastic. I think you brought in the whole point of education 4.0. And uh, uh, So what will be education 4.0 like? I think there will, there will be four critical anchors. First one being discovery. So it is not going to be one size fits all. It is about individual to discover what they are good at and what to do, what is it that they would like to do. Two individuals you know, are in, uh, need to be holistic in their approach. It is a combination of professional competency, you know, managing oneself and being responsible to the society. So social sense responsibility assumes a very important dimension when we are talking about education 4.0. And all these three lays the foundation for a successful professional. So I think four anchors when we are talking about education 4.0, and that's where uh, these things come up very clearly Number one, the whole process of discovery. It is not that something that you know uh, is thrust on an individual and you need to pursue that. Two, our future leaders need to be holistic. Third, social responsibility. I think this is one of the very important factors, particularly in a country like India, where uh, there is uh, inequality, the whole issue of you know uh, uh, public cost and private benefit is there and the whole issue of a sensitivity towards distributive justice. These are issues which cannot be ignored if we are uh, talking about a, you know, a future leader. And fourth, of course, professional competency. But only professional competency is not going to help. Only when these three are there, a successful, uh, an individual will be successful as a professional. So, the question is, how do we facilitate the process of discovery? And this was a question which was asked earlier. You know, what can schools do? I received a number of questions. What can schools do about the gig economy? And how can the school leaders actually prepare their uh, students, prepare their graduates for the future? I think the most important point which comes in is the whole issue of discovery. And I think if I have to choose one anchor here, I think this will be the key anchor. Number one anchor will be the whole process of discovery, facilitating the process of discovery. Now, how do we do that? If we look at it, each individual has got you know eight uh, intelligences, you know, of various degrees, and uh, this is uh, from the Gardner's model, who was a famous professor in uh, Har Harvard University. So he talked about the whole issue of eight intelligences, what we call the multiple intelligences, which means, uh, which are basically, the, the first one is visual spatial, people who are good in uh, art, in terms of design, etc. Second, the whole issue of linguistic and verbal, which is language abilities. Third, interpersonal, who can communicate with others. Fourth, who are inter, intrapersonal, which means somebody who can be uh, in peace with oneself, you know, this person will probably not so bothered about the quarantining that is happening today. The fifth one is the whole issue of logical mathematical people who are good in maths, then musical people who are good in music, 
the those are the ones uh, that is also a very important intelligence then the whole issue of body kinesthetic those who are good sports person those who are good in dancing those are the guys who are good in body bodily kinesthetic and lastly people who enjoy nature or naturalistics now these are the eight intelligences which an individual normally has of various degrees now if we look at the present scenario we give a disproportionate amount of weightage to you know this intelligence of logical mathematical we think that somebody if somebody is not good in mathematics that means that the person is not intelligent now the issue is the person who is good in language is also equally important so we can you know today you know we equate a wordsworth and einstein differently uh, as if somebody who is good in maths is fantastic somebody who is good in language is not that good now i think that needs to change uh, it is equally important to have the wordsworth and it is equally important to have the einsteins of the world both needs to be equally important similarly we need a musician as much as somebody who is an artist or a designer so these are the basic eight smartness uh, based on if you look at the gardner's multiple intelligence theory now the way we propose uh, to go about is this that how can we allow this whole issue of discovery can we uh, you know look at the individual's own intelligence and find out where the individual allow the individual to find out where they are good at so the important thing is allowing individuals to actually find out what is their smartness where, where they are good if somebody is good in music let the person pursue music if somebody is going look good in you know uh, enjoys nature let the person enjoy enjoy nature so how do we facilitate the process of discovery that becomes a very important factor one of the things that we uh, thought of doing is that we do a you know the discovery intelligence test which is in the model of this to find out uh, out of these eight intelligences where they are really good at and then look at you know which is the kind of profession or vocation which is going to help them achieve their mission now this is something which we would like to facilitate in the in our university particularly that a test to identify where discover where, what they are good at what is their smartness and then you know identify their passion the profession and the vocation vocation so two three important things passion profession and voca vocation and then create their own mission map as to what we would like to do now this is a basically a quick snapshot of a discovery map which can be Uh, applicable anywhere in any educational institution what is the passion what is the profession what is the vocation and what is the mission if these the congruence of these four is actually something which makes me an uh, individual a fulfilling you know fulfilling kind of an individual where i can lead a life where i am doing what i want to do and not something which has been thrust upon so this is very very uh, crucial and i think this can be done across institutions whether it is a school whether it is a college okay now across institutions i think this is feasible whether it is a school or a college as to allow the individuals to discover allow the process of discovery i think that's the most critical factor the facilitating the facilitating the process of discovery is one of the very very important factor anything that you would like to add samir over here samir anything that you would like to add over here because you are a very interesting person you were the chief strategy officer of cognizant technology solutions then and with factored analytics and high end analytics and you know and and a non engineer which people will not, never think of so based on your own experience you can say that how you came from delhi university to you know <laughs> being in a highly tech oriented industry and that to in such senior position 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the nudge, Dr. Atish. I think one of the thing which uh, I think uh, uh, as part of your conversation, I want to bring to the, uh, I would say, uh, aspect to everyone. Uh, look at this, how technology is moving today. And it's, it's a bit, I would say, future forward. Uh, the aspect of intelligence, what you talked about, Dr. Atish, is so relevant today because we are talking about intelligence makes us help take effective and accurate decisions. But here is the dichotomy. Today, decisions are being taken by artificial intelligence. The whole aspect of artificial intelligence is to mimic the human brain, which is a capability to sense, comprehend, learn, and perceive. Now think of this, an average human being, rather a human being on an average takes about 60 odd decisions on a given day, strategic, operational, tactical, what is that I have to do after this webinar? What is that my plan for the evening? What's my plan after COVID gets normal? Some of these decisions we are taking on a daily basis. And a lot of these decisions, majority of them are influenced by our previous gut, intuition, and maybe influenced by our friends, spouses, and colleagues. Now, if these decisions are being taken by today artificial intelligence, because machines have become smart, they've become intelligent, what would be the relevance of individuals, students, and professionals in the time to come? And that is what technology is forcing us to do. And as you rightly said, as part of the liberal learning, I give an example today. While we may think that artificial intelligence require only professionals from mathematics to operational research or statistics background, no, I think that's a myth. If Amazon today is coming out with Alexa, which is a success today, and we give a lot of instructions for our daily chores to Alexa. A lot of the professionals as part of the Amazon team are not the experts in mathematics or let's say uh, statistics because machines are churning and doing things on their own. What is, what is what we call machine learning? They are having a lot of professionals with a lot of proficiency in languages, dialects kind of a thing, the ability to pick up voice, modulation, linguistic. And this is what is making I mean, Alexa go into 16 more different languages within India. So one example, how today the relevance of what you talked about rightly, Dr. Atish, in terms of intelligence and liberal learning is coming into the picture in terms of new age career opportunities. Fantastic. I think the best example is uh, Samir himself being a commerce graduate and then becoming the chief strategy officer, chief digital officer of you know companies like Cognizant Technology Solutions, and then uh, with Fractal, and he is today acknowledged as one of the experts in the area of AI. So being an AI expert, being a digital expert, being good in analytics has nothing to do with being an engineer or being mathematically oriented. I think that myth needs to go. And the most important part is allow the process of discovery. Now, uh, the vocations, uh, here is a snapshot of the vocations that our university offers. The number one is the business. Number two is uh, design. Third is law. And fourth is data science. And this is the, we are at the intersection of all these four. So one can actually combine. So business with law, data science with business, design with business, design with data science, law with data science. Now, this is a very interesting aspect. Earlier, we used to have straight jacketed carriers. Okay. Now, today, the shift is from straight jacketed carriers to, you know, mix and match. So I think this is the possibility that we need to create. See, earlier you say, okay, fine, I'm getting into a, I, I'm being an, going to become an engineer. I'm going to become a bachelor of you know business. Now, why can't we combine business with law or data science with law? Now, that is something very, very important. I think our education needs to facilitate this combination based on the interest of the individual. I think that is something which needs to happen. I will give you, uh, and I don't know, uh, how it, ha you know, uh, how the other institutions can probably uh, reorient 
in terms of their whole uh, approach to the curriculum but the way we have looked at it is this that we would like to each individual in the first year of the program to be exposed to each of the areas so there they need to do courses in the area of business and accounting law and society information sciences design arts including performing performing arts environmental sciences and maths and sciences so with irrespective of the major whether you are a business major whether you are a law major whether somebody is going to specialize in design or in data science a data science guy has to do also arts similarly an arts guy has to do maths and science so that one is exposed and can find out what they, what is some, what is it that they can really feel excited about so what we call the foundation will be the general education basket the courses from each of these areas then it goes to the core courses of a particular major area so if you are a business major you will do the core course in you know uh, business if you are a design major you will do the core courses in design like that and then you go for the major or minors and it can be a major in business and maybe a minor in data that is also possible it can be a major in law with a you know minor in maybe data science now this is something which we are definitely going to felicitate now this this is something which we are uh, trying to you know make sure that the students get the opportunity what are the things which will the which will you know uh, will actually enable them to become more practice oriented yes internships both short and long term the most important is the social immersion program which is a required part required uh, which is a required course for everybody the whole issue of lifestyle or wellness and life skill which is how do we communicate how do we negotiate and a cross cultural uh, uh, you know orientation as was very clear in our you know ifim nhrd and study that research incubation becomes a very important factor that research needs to be integrated as part of the curriculum so each participant needs to have a research idea to work on okay so these are the these are required courses across you know uh, uh, across disciplines irrespective of the professional tracks you the foundation is the liberal curriculum then you come to the uh, core and the majors and minors and the practice courses become the required courses now so, samir you do like to add anything here because you have been teaching well i think you covered uh, dr atish uh, the entire uh, i would say spectrum i think one of the thing which uh, is important as you rightly said this multidisciplinary approach that ai professionals need that art appreciation and art um, and art enthusiasts need uh, understanding of the concepts of mathematics and statistics and i think that's where uh, the aspect of change of careers uh, the aspect of making well rounded uh, in your own uh, language i'm picking up the t shaped professional will come in and that's will that will actually make students much more robust in terms of a sustainable career fantastic there was a question whether a bioscience graduate can get into data science samir what do you think well i think today is a time which calls for that if if i have to go back and revisit my career i will pick up data science and bioscience it's never has been for humanity for our own sake and for the opportunity i think this is the best time clinical trial genomics uh, uh, is something which is catching fancy of all pharmaceuticals companies and uh, post covid there'll be a change in terms of how technology can augment more clinical trial uh, bioinformatics to be done on a faster basis because we all realize today that in the last 13 years we have never seen a blockbuster drug now this is where as to how fast we can come out with a drug in terms of uh, the formulation to the kind of a let's say dr drug discovery to the clinical trial and this can never be done unless the data science is being used so it is today to me a very topical career 
and one of the most sought after it will become uh, in few years. Samit, there is one more question. You know, what are the intersections or common elements when we look at, you know, a BTEC in data science and a MBA in business analytics? Because we have straddled in both. Yes. And you have been a recruiter I, also. Yes, yes. Uh, relevant question because we have to analyze this whole aspect of analytics, uh, data science and AI industry in terms of maturity. Uh, what was analytic, uh, analytics few years back has become data science, has become AI because industries have adopted in a way in terms of the usage and application and the sophistication of algorithms, uh, techniques and frameworks have led to new, I would say, innovations in data science and AI. Like AI today is an amalgamation of image, voice, text and video analytics, which is nothing like mimicking the human brain. Data science is more about new age tools and technology and analytics is more about the business side of analytics in terms of how industry needs to adopt. And it varies in terms of intersections, how different industries are at today in terms of usage and how they would be in the time to come. Fantastic. I think that answers this. Answer, answers it better than anything else. So we talked about the T shaped, you know, Samit talked about the T shaped professional. Yes, the future ready professionals will be the T shaped professionals. If you look at it, this is the clear T shape. So, what is going to happen is there will be a broad foundation of the general education, the foundation of general education, core, and the practice courses, and then you come to a specialization. So today you have the foundation of a liberal foundation, which is a very important, impo important aspect, a liberal foundation along with issues like, you know, managing oneself. And then you come to the whole issue of major and super specialization in your area of specialization. Samir, would you like to talk about something regarding the T-shaped professional? Sure, Dr. Atish. I, I think it's it's a very good uh, reflection of what you rightly said, what I say, inch wide and mile deep approach. Uh, if you look from a, a conceptual learning to contextual learning and in terms of how do we cover the whole uh, range and spectrum of subjects and course curriculum and depth in terms of uh, going deep in terms of also covering uh, contextuals uh, uh, learning and also some multidisciplinary aspect of creating a well-rounded professional. Fantastic. So this is basically the clearly what we call the T-shaped professional, a liberal foundation, a deep understanding of oneself, being socially responsible, okay, and at the same time having a deep knowledge of one's own specialization. That's something which we are talking about. The future professionals of tomorrow will be more of the T-shaped professionals. That's something very, very crucial. Uh, just to give you a brief about the programs at Vijay Bhubi University, in IFI and Business School, there will be programs in the area of management and accounting. And the Vijay Bhubi School of Law, uh, we have this integrated BBA LLB program, you know, accredited by the BCI. In the School of Design, we have programs in the area of communication design. And the very interesting school that we have is the Insofi School of Data Science. So we have actually partnered with Insofi, which is one of the uh, finest training organizations in the area of data science. You know, it is a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, who are essentially all very highly qualified from, uh, you know, PhDs from US schools like Carnegie Mellon, etc. Dakshinamurti, for example, himself is a Carnegie Mellon PhD. And uh, we have tied up with them to come up with the Insofi School of Data Science for both undergraduate and postgraduate programs in data science and artificial intelligence. And then the Vijay Bhumi School of Arts and Humanities, which is more about music and performing arts. Uh, we talk about the duration of the programs. As you can see, the Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of uh, Design, uh, Data Science, BBA, the BBA LLB, the BTEC Artificial Intelligence, the Master of Design and Master of Data Science programs, the durations are given. 
very interestingly each program irrespective of uh, the uh, school all programs are priced at 8000 bucks per credit and you know uh, uh, as per the uh, norms we do 40 credits per annum there's 40 credits per year which is the way the program goes but more interestingly whether you do a bcom or you do a btech in data science both pays the same fees which means we don't differentiate between a wordsworth and an einstein all are equally important uh, dr atish i would like to supplement to what you rightly said uh, this whole aspect of picking up uh, different programs together in one particular holistic manner uh, many of us may think that a uh, data science program itself will give us an edge from an industry or a career perspective but the fact is i give this analogy uh, look at iphone today while they create a category of their own and everyone understand that the computing power of an iphone is as equivalent of an apollo 13 the first space mission but the beauty of their phone is the functionality and that is the job of a design expert ui ux the whole aspect of how do we bring functionality from a mass adoption perspective and if data science and design can be combined today and tomorrow it's a very potent combination for a for a well rounded professional to kind of excel in an industry sabir there are two very interesting questions first i would like to take the second question first okay uh, what about the general education for students of primary and middle school level and the senior secondary classes during the lockdown stage how can we facilitate general education during the lockdown stage well i think uh, so, sorry sir i'll miss the last part okay so the question is how do we you know address the issue of general education okay at the primary and the secondary school level during the lockdown stage well i think uh, as as uh, many of the schools have realized they have started uh, going online uh, and uh, that's one but still i think there are some hassles if we see today from a bandwidth or i would say uh, work from home perspective in terms of learning but uh, i have also seen scenarios and i've talked to a couple of uh, principals from the school that how students today in their free and leisure time and picking up different i would say online portals different kind of a, let's say uh, understanding from uh, the web and trying to incorporate in their learning because many of the online portals have open free access there are a lot of those uh, learning programs and apps which are available today in terms of self learning app and also uh, students in their uh, uh, kind of a, let's say school community have been able to form those groups of like minded students to study in a concerted manner in group kind of a let's say mode but all online so some of these innovations and as we always say that adversity brings the best in terms of uh, i would say opportunity lot of students innovation i mean innovating new formulas in terms of coming out with online in their school uh, i would say age is something which is phenomenal today and i'm just sharing some of the I, best practices i spoke to these students you know we are doing an initiative called abcd which our dean of the design school is doing pravin mishra okay i think teaching drawing on an online setup is a very good example uh, you know what we are doing from a location of our university okay and today the connectivity is such the technology is such that i think it is feasible to carry on with the school education even uh, you know even in uh, even in a lockdown stage now the other question is that you know pan india millions of schools are run by government for masses are the teachers and students inclined to use online platforms for online classes from home i think uh, mr chakravarti i would like to answer this question you know i have been teaching all through and i am a typical chalk and board teacher so just to give you an example i studied in uh, kendra vidyalaya fort william and if you are aware of calcutta 
the in my days the school building which you see outside in the bank of ganges was not there the school used to happen inside the fort william where you know we used to carry our boards also on the playground but you know as the lockdown happened we immediately shifted to what i call this online mode and uh, today you see that i am doing webinars online i don't think that it is an issue of you know what i call uh, non availability of resources or technology it is just that in our mind we have to say that this is the new normal this is the new way of doing things there was one more interesting question samir i will go back to that okay cbsc has introduced applied mathematics at senior secondary level, level. where does the subject lead to a student post the school i think uh, yes uh, cbs is also introducing uh, this year uh, i mean uh, most likely artificial intelligence from 6th uh, standard onwards uh, and the textbooks are in uh, formulation mode uh, on the side of the mathematics i think there are few i would say interesting career option one is of course this whole world of data science analytics and ai because uh, mathematics is a core foundation in terms of the foundations of data science and ai uh, and also in terms of lot of uh, uh, industries we see today they are looking at mathematics to kind of solve complex problems not necessarily just using algorithm but a variety of what we say forecasting uh, kind of a, let's say techniques to come out with their own analysis in terms of how these problems can be solved so i think uh, if we really look at today this whole aspect of applied mathematics it's gained a lot of significance from a career opportunities uh, post i would say school and many of the programs in terms of how mathematics can be blended with design how mathematics can be uh, blended with operational research how mathematics can be uh, kind of blended with science has also been introduced so there are various options for you to kind of pursue if you would uh, like to kind of uh, been for this particular course fantastic i think uh, you know if you look at algebra that's you know uh, that's the uh, queen of all languages because it is the language of mathematics and knowing applied mathematics opens up lot of door and i think that's the key advantage students who will be taking this course will be having so uh, what is our curriculum like it is essentially three things okay to nurture holistic socially responsible and continuously employable professionals the key word is continuous because today we are talking about continuous learning i think that's the key of you know key thing how we create holistic individuals who are socially responsible and at the same time are learning continuously i think that is what we are you know aiming to achieve uh, our pro chancellor of the university is very eminent professor uh, who is the guru of service quality professor a parasuraman who is still the emeritus professor of university of miami he has joined us as the pro chancellor and is guiding us in our academics which is uh, a great privilege for all of us we have got a very strong faculty team you can see there are almost nine individuals with iim degrees there are a whole lot of uh, graduates from iit and bits which is 10 of them plus three with iit or bits phd six with central university degrees eight with foreign university degrees we have got one nid post graduate and of course 14 you know individuals who are uh, you know uh, been cxos earlier just like what samit dhanranjani is so we have got a very eclectic mix of faculty that is a very important aspect we are very fortunate to create an eclectic mix of faculty who are you know very inclined and are believers in our philosophy most importantly we wanted believers and we are glad that we got a group of believers who believed in what we stand for so what are the key advantages of vijay bhumi university if you look at it number one is the approach of approach of being liberal professional number two it's a bespoke so curriculum so a student can actually customize the learning pathway based on their own style pace and you know orientation we have got a fantastic group of faculty as i just talked about we also have tie ups with international schools like you know escp europe then 
State University of New York or University of Wollongong in Australia. Now, these are the schools where our students can actually opt out after two years and pursue a degree over there. So they end up getting a bachelor or a master degree from our international partner school. So that's an advantage. So bachelor degree from e any of these schools, which is also feasible. So the international pathways. You know, we are having this advantage of two cities located in Bangalore and Mumbai. Okay, so this fantastic advantage being in the commercial capital of Mumbai and the startup capital of Bangalore, the whole pedagogy is learning by doing because it is strong practice orientation. And lastly, we are talking about holistic development. I think these are the key advantages. So it's a liberal professional education, a curriculum which can be customized, best in class faculty, pathway to international degrees, advantage of two cities, Mumbai and Bangalore. Uh, pedagogy of learning by doing and the whole issue of you know holistic development samir anything that you would like to add quickly just uh, one more thing which you said in the beginning dr atesh this is also preparing or rather uh, preparing the students beyond tomorrow because the uh, the aspects and the advantages what you talked about of uh, vijay bhumi university not only are unique bespoke but they are ex exactly curated to kind of cater to what I say, the deployability of students into professional world in an accelerated fashion. Because we discussed in the beginning how the challenges are uh, multiple today. And uh, there is a void in terms of universities and academic institutions not able to really lift the deployability of students into industry. And I think through virtue of these advantages, uh, there is a larger gaps which we are addressing and students uh, through this liberal i would say aspect of learning will be able to kind of uh, really get into the next level of i would say careers much faster in the time to come fantastic point made samir uh, so this is a quick snapshot you can access this you know uh, this is a very recent article that i actually wrote in the times higher education magazine T-shaped professionals will lead the workplaces of tomorrow. And uh, I think that is where the future is. Key points, you know, it is a combination of universities adopting to edtech, the faculty 4.0, which are more like mentors and not the, you know, the uh, sage on the stage, but more of a guide by the side, you know, blending academics with practice. That's a very important factor, which, you know, Samir also talked about. You know, education system which is active, where it's a you know virtuous cycle of value creation, where academia, the professors, the students, and the industry come together to create a virtuous cycle of value creation and proactive and continuous involvement. I think these are the key factors. So uh, that's about it. Samir, anything that you would like to add, Kritika? If you if you have any points, any questions we are ready to take. I think, sir, so. both uh, you and Samir, sir, have very effectively answered all the questions uh, while discussing your perspectives. And you have also taken some of the questions that have already been asked by the various attendees of uh, this session. Uh, so I think on the questions front, I think uh, we definitely have covered most of the points. Um, I'd like to, I think this brings us to the end of this session. Um, I'd definitely like to personally thank Dr. Akish Chattopadhyay and Mr. Samit Hanrajani for taking out time and to be with us today and give us these insightful presentations. Uh, also, I would like to say that, you know, we have shared a link of a survey that uh, Vijayabhumi University is anchoring for students to understand how they feel about, uh, you know, learning during the lockdown, online learning, what is their view about the future. So we're doing this survey because we wish to compile this into a report, which we want to present to the authorities to bring forth the concerns of the students. So we'd be really grateful if you could pass on the link to your students. It's already mentioned in the chat box and we can get as many students and record their responses uh, to the survey. I'd like to thank each and every one of you personally for attending this session. We hope you found it insightful. We hope you found it uh, helpful. 
Atish sir has already shared his email ID on the chat box. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to him. Knowing him, he's very prompt in replying. Thank you so much. Stay